Imagine a soldier, he is about to go into battle, but he is scared, his feet are cold. This, my friends, is one of the earliest known instances of cold feet. Not in a romantic sense, mind you, but in a very literal, very fearful one. The year, the late 1800s, the place, the battlefields of America and Europe. The phrase cold feet emerged from the trenches, a colorful way to describe the physical sensation of fear. Soldiers facing the horrors of war often experienced this chill in their extremities. It was a natural, visceral response to danger. The expression, though, quickly transcended the physical. It became shorthand for hesitation, for a sudden loss of courage in the face of adversity. And like many colorful phrases born from the military, it quickly seeped into everyday language. Soldiers returning home from war brought with them their slang, their stories, their experiences, and with them, they brought the phrase cold feet. Language like water finds a way. By the late 19th century, cold feet began appearing in literature. It popped up in newspapers, in novels, in plays. It was a phrase on the move, gaining traction. No longer confined to the battlefield, it now described any kind of hesitation or reluctance. Mark Twain, that master of the American vernacular, used it. O. Henry, the short story virtuoso, used it too. They recognized its power, its ability to convey a complex emotion with simple, relatable imagery. A character about to make a risky financial investment might get cold feet. A young woman on the verge of elopement might experience a sudden case of cold feet. The phrase was proving to be remarkably adaptable, its meaning expanding beyond the battlefield to encompass a wider range of human experiences. And as it spread, it began to evolve. It wasn't always about fear anymore. Sometimes it was about doubt, about second thoughts. Sometimes it was even tinged with a hint of humor. The stage, that grand platform for human drama, provided fertile ground for cold feet. Playwrights, always attuned to the nuances of language, recognized its potential. They inserted it into the mouths of their characters, using it to heighten tension, to create comedic effect, to explore the complexities of human decision-making. Imagine a scene. A young man paces nervously backstage. He is about to make his stage debut. His voice catches in his throat. He wipes clammy hands on his trousers. I think I'm getting cold feet, he confesses to a fellow actor. The audience chuckles, recognizing the universal fear of the unknown. From Shakespearean tragedies to light-hearted comedies, cold feet found its place in the theater. It became a shorthand for stage fright, for the jitters that come with performing in front of an audience. And as audiences heard the phrase spoken on stage, they incorporated it further into their own vocabularies. Section four. Cold feet in the 20th century, solidifying its place in common language. The 20th century, with its wars and its revolutions, its social upheavals and its technological advancements, only solidified the place of cold feet in the English language. It appeared in novels by Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, in poems by Sylvia Plath and Langston Hughes. It was a phrase that transcended genres, that spoke to something fundamental about the human experience. Newspapers used it to describe politicians backing down from controversial decisions. Sports writers used it to explain why a star athlete might choke under pressure. It was everywhere, a ubiquitous expression that had become an indispensable part of the English lexicon. And with each passing decade, its meaning continued to evolve. It became less about literal fear and more about figurative hesitation. It could be used seriously to describe a life-altering decision or it could be used playfully to describe a minor case of nerves. Section five, the wedding context, a modern interpretation of an old phrase. Today, cold feet is perhaps most commonly associated with weddings. It's the fear, the doubt, the last minute jitters that can strike a bride or groom before they say I do. It's the sudden realization of the enormity of the commitment they're about to make. But even in this context, the phrase retains a hint of its historical origins. It's not necessarily a sign that the wedding is doomed, it's simply a natural human response to a momentous life event. It's a reminder that even in the face of great joy and excitement, a little bit of fear and uncertainty is perfectly normal. And perhaps that's why the phrase has endured for so long. Because it speaks to something universal, something timeless. It acknowledges the vulnerability that lies beneath the surface of even the strongest emotions. 
Section 6 conclusion, the enduring power of cold feet. From the battlefields to the stage to the wedding aisle, cold feet has come a long way. It's a testament to the power of language, to its ability to evolve and adapt to changing times. But it's also a reminder that some things never change. Whether you're a soldier facing enemy fire or a bride about to walk down the aisle, that feeling of hesitation, of uncertainty, is something we can all relate to. It's a part of what makes us human. And in its own strange way, it's a comfort to know that there's a phrase for it, a phrase that has been passed down through generations, a phrase that captures the essence of that feeling with such simple, evocative imagery.